Welcome to Chapter 25, Paired Samples and Blocks. Data are paired when the observations are collected in pairs, or the observations in one group are naturally related to observations in the other group. Paired data arise in a number of ways. Perhaps the most common way is to compare subjects with themselves before and after a treatment. When pairs arrive, arise from an experiment, the pairing is a type of blocking. When they arise from an observational study, it is a form of matching. If you know the data are paired, you can and must take advantage of it. To decide if the data are paired, consider how they were collected and what they mean. Check the W's. There is no test to determine whether the data are paired. You have to think about the situation. Once we know the data are paired, we can examine the pairwise differences. Because it is the differences we care about, we treat them as if they were the data set and ignore the original two sets of data. Now that we have only one set of data to consider, we can return to the simple one sample t-test. So in your calculator, you will just be doing the, the t-test. Okay, you don't have to specify that it's paired. You have to know it and you have to create the differences, but your calculator doesn't have to know that it's working with the differences of paired data. Mechanically, a paired t-test is just a one sample t-test for the means of the pairwise differences. That's why your calculator doesn't know the difference. The sample size is simply the number of pairs. Okay, so assumptions and conditions, we always have to check our conditions in order to be able to make our assumptions. The assumption for using this is that the data are indeed paired. You do have to check that by thinking about how the data were collected. Independence assumption, the differences must be independent of each other. We have to think about that and see if uh, we can make that assumption. Randomization condition checks for that. Randomness can arise in many ways. We want to know, usually, uh, what we want to know usually focuses our attention on where the randomness should be. Again, we're looking for random surveys or um, experimentation with appropriate randomness involved. 10% condition, when a sample is obviously small, we may not explicitly check this condition. Um, this condition is not as big a deal with means as it was with proportions. Normal population assumption, we need to assume that the population of differences follows a normal model. So you want to check this with a histogram or normal probability plot. Sometimes a stem plot will work or dot plot. But again, we don't have two like we did when we were doing two sample inference. We're just going to have one because we're just looking at the differences. The paired t-test. When the conditions are met, we are ready to test the paired difference whether the, the paired differences differ significantly from zero. We test the hypothesis H naught mu D, the mean of the differences, is equal to delta naught, where the Ds are the pairwise differences and delta naught is almost always zero. We use the test statistic T with n minus one degrees of freedom equals the average difference from our sample minus the hypothesized difference, usually zero, divided by the standard error of the average differences, where n is the number of pairs. The standard error of the average difference is equal to the standard deviation of our sample of differences divided by the square root of n. It's the ordinary standard error for the mean just applied to the differences. When the conditions are met and the null hypothesis is true, the statistic follows a student's t model on n minus 1 degrees of freedom, so we can just use them, that model to obtain a p-value, or we can let our calculator use that model to obtain a p-value. So for confidence intervals, when the conditions are met, we're ready to find the confidence interval for the mean of the paired differences. The confidence interval follows the same form that they all do. It's estimate plus or minus critical value times standard error standard deviation. So in this case, it's the average difference plus or minus the critical value of t for n minus 1 degrees of freedom times the standard error of the average difference, which is the same as what we saw previously when we looked at hypothesis testing. 
The critical value T star depends on the particular confidence level C that you specify and on the number of degrees of freedom, which is N minus 1 in this case, which is based on the number of pairs, which is N. Consider estimating the mean difference in the age between husbands and wives. The following display is worthless. It does no good to compare all the wives as a group with all the husbands. We care about the pair differences. So we don't care about the difference between the average wife and the average husband. We care about the average of the differences between the pairs of husbands and wives. In this case, we have paired data. Each husband is paired with his respective wife. The display we are interested in is, interested in is the difference and, and ages. So here's all our differences in ages of each husband-wife pairing. Pairing removes the extra variation that we saw in the side-by-side -side box plots and allows us to concentrate, concentrate on the variation associated with the difference in age for each pair. A paired design is an example of blocking. So what can go wrong? Don't use a two-sample t-test for paired data. Two sample t-tests are for two independent groups. Don't use a paired t-method when the samples aren't paired. Okay, use the two sample uh, methods. There's a whole reason why we've got two whole different chapters on this, um, because it makes a difference. Don't forget outliers. The outliers we care about now are in the differences. Don't look for the difference between means of paired groups with side-by-side -side box plots. You want to take the differences and then look at one histogram or or even one box plot, one stem plot of the differences. All right, we're ready for examples. Let's look at exercise two on page 602. Some students do homework with the TV on. Some researchers want to see if people can as effectively can work as effectively without distraction. The researchers will time some volunteers to see how long it takes them to complete some relatively easy crossword puzzles. During some of the trials, the room will be quiet. During other trials in the same room, a TV will be on tuned to MTV. Design an experiment that will require a two-sample T procedure to analyze the results. Okay, you could make a diagram. I just described it in words. We're going to randomly assign half the vo volunteers to do the puzzles, not dot he puzzles. Let me fix that real quick. To do the puzzles in a quiet room and half to do them in a, the room with MTV on the television. At the end, of course, you would compare the results. Again, here we've got two independent groups because they were randomly assigned to the two treatments, and then you're just going to compare the average at the end. Now we want to design an experiment that will require a match pairs T procedure to analyze the results. Remember, we talked about that often um, paired data come from before and after well, um, type experiments. It can also come from people doing two different types of treatments. So that's how I'm going to do this. Randomly assign half the volunteers to do a puzzle in a quiet room and half to do a puzzle with MTV on the television. Then have each person do a puzzle under the, under, under the other condition. Look at the differences for each person. Now, you may wonder, well, why do half have to start with the quiet condition and half have to start with the TV condition and then switch? Well, it may be that people get fatigued of doing crossword puzzles and naturally the second one's just going to take a little longer. Or it could be that on average people get primed by their first one and take a little longer on the first one and on the second one. Their brain's thinking in that way. Um, it's warmed up and they may naturally do faster on the second one. By having half of them do each condition first and half each do condition the other condition second, we, we take care of that. Okay, we get that where it's not going to affect the outcome because it should be that whatever natural tendency there is will be operating equally on both groups. Which experiment would you consider the stronger design? Why? Well, some people are really, really good at crossword puzzles and some people just take forever with them. And so um, there's a lot of variability there. And when that's the case, you don't want to accidentally you know, through randomization, just by chance, have all your strong puzzle people in one group or the other, because it will, the um, individual's ability of, of completing crossword puzzles quickly will um, 
mess with the results. What will be, we wouldn't get a good read by taking it into consider taking that into consideration and making sure that every individual does both both conditions. We take out that natural variability of just individual ability on uh, completing crossword puzzles. So match pairs is stronger because people vary greatly in their ability to do crossword puzzles. The match pair designs controls for this variability. All right, having done, uh, now we're moving on to exercise 20 on page 609. Having done poorly on their math final exams in June, six students repeat the course in summer school and take another exam in August. If we consider these students to be representative of all students who might attend the summer school in other years, do these results provide evidence that the program is worthwhile? Now let's think about this. We've got individual students and their scores. Okay, so student one made a 54 in June, a 50 in August. Student two made a 49 in June, and 65 in August, and so forth. So obviously these two groups of data are not independent because the same individuals were used in both groups. We have a before and after situation here. So this is clearly paired data. So what you're going to do is you're going to enter August minus June in a list because you want to see if the scores improved after being in summer school. So you do after minus before. And that way if there's a positive increase in the scores, it shows up as a positive number. If you do June minus August, a positive result would end up with a negative difference. And that can just be kind of confusing. So do always do after minus before. And do a one sample t-test on the differences. So go in your calculator and do this name the list. You can just call it difference or scores, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. And then tell the calculator you want to do a t-test. And your null hypothesis is going to be that the mean of your um, differences is zero. Now we're interested in the program being worthwhile. If the program on average causes the scores to go down, it's probably not worthwhile. We're really only considered an improvement. So we want to uh, test against the alternative that the mean difference is greater than zero, okay, that there is a, an increase in scores on average for individuals. Um, so when you do that, you get a T-score of 1.75, and there's five degrees of freedom because there's six individuals, and you get a P-value of 0.0699. Well, that's larger than 0 0.05, so due to our large p-value, and again, I reported it there, 0 0.0699, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. It does not appear that the summer program is worthwhile. This conclusion, of course, may be incorrect. If so, which type of error was made? Well... Type 2, we failed to reject the null, so the only way we would be mistaken is if the null is actually false. So that is a type 2 error. Okay, remember type 1 error is you reject the null and it actually turns out to be true. So the only way we could be wrong is if the null is actually false and we retained it. Okay, all right. So that is it for this presentation. I will see you in class. Have a good day.